So with my <laughs> adult go. allowance, I actually made twenty one dollars. <laughs> but I was adult like, okay. Allowance. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a piece of paper that said, Sean Chandler talks about 2020 plan. He's torn up in pieces, threw it up in the air, and then captioned it. I guess I'll go and apply in Mc- at McDonald's. Right now, I'm actually 10 pounds heavier than I was the first time you saw me after I had this job. And you're like, well, have you been lifting weights? I was like, no, I deliver pain. That's amazing. <laughs> and so I've stuck with it. So I'm actually now it's even not 10 true. pounds heavier than that. And my body fat's dropping. So old age has been, been fun. Anyway, 20 minutes, sometimes it's 40 minutes. But the, then you have next week's episode, um, or with a novel, it's a contained story, but most novels take you 8, 20, if it's a Sting, Stephen King novel, 100 hours to read. Um, you you know, say that as I have the last Dark Tower book on my nightstand that I'm close <laughs> to finishing. He's staring at you. <laughs> yep. You started it when you were in high school and you're almost <laughs> done. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Ben just started watching it like yesterday. So, I mean, oh people are gosh. still picking it up. I'm on my fourth <laughs> You're watch never going to live this down. <laughs> You're never going to live this down. Ever. Ben, please tell Sean live on the air uh, when you started watching The Office. I don't want to talk about it. Hey, MVP family. This is the Micah and Ben podcast where we promote having conversations around topics that we all face, but very few of us discuss. This podcast is where casual conversation leads ultimately to a strength in us. The point is, is that even when challenging obstacles come our way, we have to remember that we're not alone. It's easy to see the highlight reel that we see on social media and believe that that's the full story, but that's typically just one side of the story. So let's have conversations that involve all sides of our lives, not just that one side, and hopefully encourage each other by doing so. So join us as we have candid conversations We're probably going to throw in some humor as we chat. And then in the end, don't forget to subscribe or like or follow us on whatever platform you're using. Be sure to also like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ActualMVP or email us at ActualMVP at gmail.com. Right now, the real estate market is hot, which is kind of surprising, but also not. If you're stuck inside all the time, you start to realize just how much space you don't have and you might want. The trouble is, when you get to that spot, who do you talk to? Who do you call? What if you could know one of the top 50 realtors in Austin, Texas, and more importantly, one of my favorite human beings of all time? Well, guess what? You can. His name is Barrett Raven, and he is one of the top 50 realtors in Austin. He works at Realty Austin, and he's also one of my favorite people and one of my closest friends. He has been my realtor and one of my best friends for the last four years. If you're looking for somebody who not only can meet you where you are, but also answer a million questions because he has actually been a middle school teacher, so he's used to it, you should reach out to Barrett and his team at BarrettRaven at RealtyAustin.com. That's B-A-R-R-E-T-T-R-A-V-E-N at RealtyAustin.com. Have you ever been like, man, I need to read that book. And then you throw out the excuse that you don't have any time. Well, lucky you, we're now all in quarantine and have way too much time on our hands. And we realize that was never a valid excuse to begin with. But sitting and reading a book may actually take up more of your time. And considering you're listening to this podcast, you might be the type of person that prefers audiobooks. I know I do. I like to be able to multitask, you know, like taking a shower and listening to Extreme Ownership, or cooking and listening to The Flip Side, both of which are books that we've mentioned on this podcast. So if you're interested in trying that out, no strings attached, you want to get a free 30-day trial to just see what it's like, I guess, listen and hear what it's like, go to audibletrial.com forward slash MBP. That will get you access to a free 30-day trial. Thanks to us, our gift to you. So if you like listening to this podcast, you'll probably like listening to books. Just remember to go to audibletrial.com forward slash MBP. On today's episode, we will have a special guest, very special guest. You'll find that he is extremely comfortable being in front of a camera because he has his own YouTube channel with over 154,000 subscribers, thousand. One day we'll get there, Ben, but... In the meantime, we have him on today to talk about uh, a handful of things. 
the two main ones though are one his background and his story which i i know for a fact many of us will resonate with simply because he's also posted videos with this story and gotten tremendous feedback the second part of that is also how videos movies tv shows affect us uh we'll even dive into how his own video of sharing his story has affected other people. So it should be a great time. We hope that you enjoy it. Be sure to not only subscribe to our channel, but also to Sean's, and we will make sure that you have that link and that information. Here we go. Sean, thanks for joining us on our podcast. Um, For those of us that haven't been part of the many subscribers to your YouTube channel, give us a little background. Who are you? What exactly do you do? Maybe what did you do before getting onto this podcast via being a YouTube sensation? <laughs> sensation. Wow. Oh, I, <laughs> now I have to live up to all that hype. Oh, um, yeah. Hype. So I back in summer of 2016 on a whim, I went to go see the new Ghostbusters movie with my wife for date night and went, all right, everybody's talking about this movie. Why don't I hop on that YouTube channel I have that I never post anything on and <laughs> post a review? And because everyone had these big, extreme, over the top opinions about it, and whether there was like, you love it, if you don't like it, it's because you're a sexist, or they hate it because all kinds of other reasons why you might hate it. I was like, right there in the middle, I was like, I didn't hate it. It was fine. It's not certainly not great. Doesn't live up to the original. So tried to just put a little voice of reason movie review out there for it, and um, had fun doing that. Stuck with it, and two and a half years in, was able to go full time. There you go. And through the course of things, I've um, I'm a Rotten Tomatoes certified critic, gotten to do some pretty cool interviews. And um, basically, I wouldn't call myself a movie critic, I'm more, much more someone that I'm just a fan that got lucky enough to be able to have the conversations I like to have in person over the internet. And so that's what I try to do. Whatever's kind of interesting to me, whatever the subjects that I feel like there's a conversation I can add something to, that's what I talk about on my channel. And it's uh, it's been a pretty cool little experience. That's so awesome. That's that's what my my channel is. Um, I guess the other question in there was, um, what did I do before this? Yeah, is that like what I, you did? did you just trip into it? And I know it's kind of <clears throat> somewhat of a like a an accident. I know you've told me before it was like a hobby turned turned profession. So what kind of was the the process of tripping into it, if you will? And um, to add to that question, where was the transition of like hard commit, if that makes sense? Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I started it entirely just as a hobby. I mean, there wasn't much of any greater ambitions when I started. But I think everybody that starts a podcast YouTube channel, you have it in that thought like, man, I that wouldn't it be cool if I got to do this full time? Um, yeah. so of course I had all of those thoughts in my head whenever I started and, um, but, uh, you know, and I tried to, I'd failed at a lot of things before and any of this YouTube channel, actually, I started back in, I think 2013 posted my first movie review and TV reviews. And then I do like two reviews, take six months off to post two. And so <laughs> even when I started, I kind of assumed it was only going to last, you know, like, a like a couple weeks. I didn't think at all I was going to stick with it because I'd done such a bad job of being consistent with everything else that I'd done. And I'd done blogs and stuff and I'd failed at those too. So I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, this will be fun for two weeks. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and a couple weeks in, I had, I did a, um, a ranking video with all the, a new Star Trek movie came out, Star Trek Beyond. So I ranked all the Star Trek movies, big Star Trek fan. And this video two weeks in got like 2000, 3000 views. So for me, having done blogging for years and I had two blogs in seven years or something like that, that ever got (laughs) 2000 views clicks or whatever. I was like, wait, okay. In two weeks I did about as much success as I had doing that for seven years. And I don't have to write and edit myself. All right. This YouTube thing's way better than blogging. So I just kind (laughs) of stuck with it. I stuck with it. And at the time I didn't have a job. And so I couldn't even go see new movies. So I had a movie channel where I was reviewing movies, but I couldn't see anything new. So I was just doing all kinds of weird stuff and um, made it to, that was July that I first posted. So, and I had some good success uh, over those first six months. And so going into 2017, 
I had a t- conversation with the wife and it's like, hey, I'm digging this and I'm getting some momentum. Can I make this like a part of my actual schedule? Like, I mean, legitimately every Thursday night I'm at the new movies. Can I do that? She's uh, yes, you can do that. Um, make a commit to it. So clearly you enjoy doing this. Go for it. And, you know, when we get into some other story, there's a reason that you probably also wanted me out of the house at the time. But so <laughs> was it was not good. <laughs> no, but um, all on me. All, I'm the bad guy in that story. But so um, so January 2017, where it's like, all right, I'm going to try and make this work. And then about six months later, I, I was considering um, quitting. I was a year in and I'd, I got to a thousand subscribers. But, you know, at the same time, I made like uh, April of. April 2017 hit a thousand subscribers. Um, but I only made it like $11 that month with YouTube. Actually, excuse me. The month before I started a Patreon page in my, which so like a membership site where people get extra access. Mm-hmm. And my mom signed up for that at $10. So with my <laughs> adult go. allowance, I actually made $21, <laughs> but I was like, adult okay. Allowance. <laughs> Thanks mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she actually upped her, her, her payment last month, actually. So uh, now I make uh, $20 from my mom each oh, month. Oh, so big she's, cinder. <laughs> um, so, but, and I, I, I was underemployed. I, after, about right around, right around when I started the channel, got some momentum. I did get a job delivering paint. It's so a severely underemployed. So I was looking back to, to getting a job again, a, a normal job to kind of use some of my skill sets. Because I was li- literally delivering paint, like picking up buckets all day long. Yeah, and, you were Jack. Um, we can just it, say it was, that. You were Jack. It was nice. Yeah, I, it was pretty cool. <laughs> I was a skinny guy growing up and hated it. And then I got this job delivering paint and like in two months put on 15 pounds of muscle and it stuck with me. So like right now I'm even – right now I'm actually 10 pounds heavier than I was the first time you saw me after I had this job. And you're like, what have you been lifting weights? I was like, no, I deliver paint. It's amazing. <laughs> and so I've stuck with it. So I'm actually now it's even natural. 10 pounds heavier than that. And my body fat's dropping, so old age has been been fun. Anyway, so I, I was thinking about, like, I think I might have to quit the YouTube thing, get a job that uh, requires a little bit more of me. So I was thinking I'd have to quit. This is summer 2017, about one year in. Mm-hmm. I started applying for some some jobs and stuff. I came out of Church World. We could talk about that in a little bit, but I came out of Church World, was looking to get back into it. And then I had a couple things happen where I – I made some made some money from YouTube. I had a couple of nice little bursts. So I was like, okay, I'll stick with it a little bit longer. One of them was this company called Movie Pass that um, was huge, yep. huge for a little bit there. Yep. I started using them before they kind of really got super famous, mm-hmm. and I was an affiliate for them, which means that if someone uses my link to sign up for them, I would get like ten dollars. Yeah, and. Then at one point in time, they dropped their membership cost to $10 a month, and you could see unlimited movies, and I was an affiliate for them. So I just promoted this deal everywhere, so I made like $500 from this affiliate program in two weeks, hey. and then they canceled <laughs> the affiliate program. And so I was like, oh, wait, cool. I'm making a little bit of money. I guess I'll stick with YouTube just a little bit longer and see what happens. And then in um, November, maybe October, uh, doesn't matter, fall 2017, Thor Ragnarok came out, and somewhere around this time, I would discovered doing ranking videos like regularly like a weekly thing yeah made that my strategy my thing to kind of distinguish myself was ranking movie franchises from the worst to the best like pirates of the caribbean which one's the worst one which one's the best one and so i've been doing this for about six months and had good success with it so pulling into when thor ragnarok came out i was about two thousand three thousand subscribers and so I'd, i'd really picked up since i'd been thinking about quitting and um, my normal rankings had been about 40 minutes long. They're really podcasts, but um, you know, post them as YouTube videos. And I went, what if I did ranked all the Marvel movies in under 10 minutes? Because I'm never going to watch one of my videos. That's way too long. I don't have that much time. <laughs> but I can watch a 10-minute version of it. And so I was like, I'll make it 10 minutes. I'll try and make it a little bit funnier, and I'll improve my editing on it. So I post this video. Up to this point in time, the video I had the most views was like 22,000. Post this video. It does okay. Does is good numbers. It was like ten thousand views in the first week, and then one weekend it just takes off and it starts getting like thirty thousand views per day. Ends up getting like 300,000 views. But at the time, I was like, "Whoa, bonkers, crazy!" And it it, it just enough money to fill in the gap between my delivering paint job and what I really needed to make. And that's where I went. Okay, I uh, I don't think I want to go back to church world um, on staff. I don't want to work at a church. Talked to my wife. I was like, "Hey, I don't. Do you want me to work at a church?" She's like, "No, don't do that. I don't want you to do that." It's like, "Yeah, I don't think I want to do that either." Like, 
and going back just because I, I need to make more money is that's a really bad idea. And this YouTube thing's making just enough money to, to fill in the gap. Let's take a risk on this. So jump forward a few months from there, Black Panther came out. And I've heard of that one. Yes, it, it's <laughs> some, some people went to go see it. Yeah. And someone in the, my comments recommended I rank all of the Marvel villains. And so I did Ooh. that the week after Black Panther came out. And it was a big hit right out of the gate. And then I was like, I'll, I'll do the heroes too. So two days later, I, I did the heroes. And those two videos to this day, both are the two highest viewed videos on my channel. One of them's just shy of a million and the other one's about 700,000 views. And so these suggestions from a random person in the comment section basically transformed my life because um, when Black Panther came out, I was about 10,000 subscribers. And then six weeks later, I was at 20,000. And that just kind of kept Ooh. going for a while. And um, it didn't really slow down for about 18 months. About last fall, it slowed down for a little bit there. But um, so it, you know, that's when I started uh, making enough money. I was like, I need to start thinking about how to you know, um, re responsibly transition to full time is what I started thinking. And that was February of 2018. And a year later, almost to the week, almost a year after Black Panther came out, uh, I quit my job and um, went full time with this, this YouTube thing. That is awesome. And it's like, it's funny to think, uh, hearing some pieces in there of, you know, where you thought, ah, I'll try this, you know, I'll try right. that. And it's to you, it's, it's not, uh, cause I, I'm saying this as like a reflective exercise. I think sometimes, eh, this isn't really like that novel of an idea. Like I, I don't really think I have anything spectacular to share, right. but then I just share what I know. And somebody's like that. I've never even thought of that. That's yeah. incredible. And it's you and I've had this conversation. I didn't think anything was special about what was going on in my life. It just, it's my life. It's yeah. not to me. It's not excellent or terrible. It just is. And there's highlights and lowlights all the same. And so to you talking about the, the different videos that you're like, yeah, I'll try to rank that in under 10 minutes. It just sounds like a challenge where you're thinking, mm -hmm. let's give it a shot and see what happens. And then turns out people love it. Uh, so if that if that's the beginning, what kind of like jump forward to let's say even just this week? You know, I'm I get the updates because I'm subscribed to your channel, so I get the updates. So you're constantly uh, loading up videos, and you've also kind of added a second arm to what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about kind of where things are now. Yeah, so um, as of the time that we're recording this, um, we and we're st everything's still in lockdown, and um, movies don't come out anymore. So the strategy, basically, that I had starting, um, as like I mentioned, around May 2017, my strategy was essentially I'm going to whenever a new movie comes out, rank the franchise. And then it expanded mm -hmm. when Black Panther came out. I'm going to rank the franchise and the heroes, the villains, final battles. And I kept expanding. But it was essentially my calendar is based off new movies come out. That's what people are talking about. And therefore, I'm going to lean into that and drive the conversation. And these rankings that, you know, I just looked at what people were doing on blogs and tried to take some st ideas from that and make the version that I wanted to see, which was a little bit more personal, a person's experience rather than a brand because uh, I saw all these blogs or looper.com and it was generic brand ranking something. But what about a person that has a specific taste? And so that's what I did. And then March of uh, this year, all movie releases are postponed for six months. <laughs> and there's is, um, had a little bit there. I was like, OK, my entire strategy of how I've gotten here doesn't work anymore. It's been quarantined. As it's well. been it has been <laughs> quarantined itself. So I literally posted a video on the internet and it was like me and it was a piece of paper that said, Sean Chandler talks about 2020 plan It is torn up in pieces, threw it up in the air and then captioned it. I guess I'll go and apply in Mac at McDonald's <laughs> and all these people, which wouldn't have been a good strategy since McDonald's can't open either. Um, all these people <laughs> messaged me, dude, don't quit YouTube. It, it'll be okay. I was like, no, it was a joke. It's you guys just you guys just don't get my sense of humor. I'm not going anywhere. I just need to come up with a new plan. And so basically, what I did was I um I just looked back at the kind of really the history of my whole channel and looked at my top 50 biggest hit videos, and I just made a list of the type, like what. What was I doing at the editorial, ranking, movie review, retro review, like whatever category it falls into? And then what's the topic? 
made a big gigantic list of topics mm. and then I just started cross-referencing them. Like what's everything I haven't done with this? What's everything I haven't done with this, uh, with the Spider-Man franchise that I've already done with the Marvel Cinematic Universe? What have I already done with the Marvel Cinematic Universe that I haven't done with Batman yet? And I just made this list of like 120 ideas. And then I just posted it publicly to people and said, hey, what do you guys think I should do? Whatever suggestions you guys like from other people, click like on it. So people would like certain ones. And I read through it and went, which are the hit ideas in here? Made a poll. Since I have you know 150,000 subscribers, you put up a poll and you get 10,000 people voting on it. That's a pretty good sample size of my audience. For real. <laughs> and, and so then I just start polling people and they would pick, like they already voted. They already told me which ones they want to see and would, like pretty quickly went, okay, these other ideas are bad. And then I would just take the winner of that one and three more and throw them together. And you, you pretty quickly start to figure out a bunch of good ideas. And so actually now that there's no new movies and I'm using this new strategy, um, it's actually kind of breathe fresh air into my channel or life into it uh, for the first time in a while because it's all these new ideas that, you know you run a little bit stale when it's like all these movie rankings hero rankings villain rankings final battle rankings it's yeah. all the same same thing it's a ranking and so then because no new movies are coming out it was a chance to reinvent myself at a point in time where um, a lot of the noise and clutter on YouTube is is cleared out because it's not everybody competing for the same thing. You know, there's not enough movie review movies to review to to be compete with each other. So it's who has the best ideas. And so then, that's what one thing that I've been doing recently. And um, just as a a separate thing from that, I've always kind of been a teacher by nature, as I mentioned, alluded to before. Worked in church world and like to help people out. So one thing that I'm I'm slowly starting to work on is getting together. Um, kind of my own course on how to do YouTube stuff and some cold consulting things that kind of came out of the blue of uh, I'd never done any consulting until like three weeks ago. And then in the span of two weeks, I had four or five different consulting calls all in different places. One of the, you know, one oh, of them wow. was I talked, you asked me about some of this uh, podcasting stuff. They had yeah. someone else asked me, I was starting a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. A church brought me on to discuss social media. Oh, wow. um, I, I was, someone had me read their script and get, like, it's like, wow, this is all in the span of two weeks. And so it's like, okay, I think the universe is trying to tell me something here about um, something else I should be working on. I've been thinking on it for a while. So I actually put out an ebook like a week ago on 30 questions for a hit YouTube, uh, nerdy YouTube video, something like that. I, I, oh, okay. I, should probably, I should probably know the title for it, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, um, Would you like to plug it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll put that in here. Yeah, it, well, I mean, it, basically, if, you, if you're looking to do a nerdy movie YouTube or movie channel or nerdy channel in general, I put out a video a week ago called um, 10 Tips for Starting a Movie Channel, but it's more general tips that applies to most, about seven out of the 10 apply to everyone, and then three of them are specific to being a, a movie critic person. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, in it, it kind of has the link to where you can get that for free and everything. But it's, you know, okay. it's, it's, I don't know, it's like four or five thousand words. So it's a pretty quick little read. Lots of bullet points, lots of questions to like. Um, it's designed as a walkthrough of the process of how I make a video from idea to filming to editing to um, the way it's posted and then sharing it afterwards. Um, I was going to call it a field questions. manual. It's it, manual, exactly like, field manual. It's <laughs> it's yeah, it's not a bunch of paragraphs. It's like a paragraph, and then here's bullet points, questions to make you really think through how you're doing stuff. And then I'm I'm working on a, a like an actual course that, um, a bunch of different stuff. So, um, on a scale from uh, baking instructions to IKEA instructions, how how easy is it to understand your walkthrough? Um. You know, it, it's kind of designed, it's not designed as a, you've never posted a video before. <laughs> and so here's how to teach you how to post a YouTube video. It's it's kind of assuming that you have the basic knowledge of, of YouTube, that you, you've you posted some stuff, you kind of know what the, the things are that are out there. And so it's designed in a manner, so you've got a channel and you want to know how to think more holistically, how to think about sure. the big picture. So starting with the first section on coming up with your ideas, it's like, how does this fit in with your goal for your channel? How does this, how does this help you achieve what you're really going for? Is this off topic? If it is off topic, why is it off topic? Because sometimes right. like sometimes I'll post video game videos and there's a reason for that. I want to have something that's just a little bit off, but that helps people know me more. But if I was starting out, that would be a pretty bad idea because then it just confuses people as to what my channel's about. But well, shoot, um, we, we should have had you on the video game episode we just dropped. <laughs> apparently, that I'm would've... a master of that, yeah, because I, I <laughs> posted a video yesterday about a gaming chair. So, Ooh, uh, yeah. yeah. 
I'm already um, convinced that I'm going to get one of those here soon because I've got back problems. And currently, I, I've been laid out the majority of the day because my back is hurting so bad. So a gaming chair is in the very near future. I'm not going to say that I could probably live in my chair, but it's you could probably live in four your chair. years old. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this thing is it's built like a brick house and is the most comfortable piece of furniture I think I own. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Sean, uh, as far as everything that you've been able to do, uh, you've, you kind of alluded to a part of your story that you said you would touch on in, in just a little bit. Considering I know what our channel, uh, our show is about, um, kind of having those conversations that most people don't want to have, even though we experience a lot of the same things. We just don't talk about it. So I would love to kind of give you the floor just to share the Sean Chandler that everybody sees on YouTube and the 150 K people are subscribed to, uh, would you like to share with our audience just kind of what you were talking about and just how that, that journey came about and what it's led to? I, I was a youth pastor or the associate pastor at my church for about eight years. And, you know, for, I thought I was going to be pastor forever. That was the, kind of the whole plan. And, um, what kind of went off was uh, church world's a lot more stressful than you realize, or, or it can be. And so my my dad growing up was an alcoholic. And so when I was underage, I never drank. I ended up drinking himself to death when I was 20 years old. Mm. And um, so alcoholism runs pretty heavily in my family. And somewhere along the way, a couple of incidents happened where something bad enough uh, at a friend of mine whose brother might have attempted suicide, might have just had a really bizarre accident and was put in a coma. And I was 21 at the time. He showed up at my house with some some alcohol and um, basically it was like, hey, man, my brother might die. Will you drink with me? And I was like, all right, I'm 21. I'm at my house. This is pretty sick. This is if there's a good excuse to do this. This is it. This is good enough tragedy. Uh, and so just drink. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a beer. I mean, it was whatever vodka or whatever he brought, something intense. And that basically started a pattern in my life of using tragedy as an excuse to do something that I knew in light of my family's history was probably a really bad idea. And mm -hmm. jump you know, forward when I you know, five, six years after that, when I'd been married just 51 weeks 51 weeks one shy of one, one year anniversary we left town for a couple of days came back and our apartment was cleaned out uh robbed good night wow and and it, it was like one of these ones where you like went back to our door to open it and opened it and but there was the chain lock on the back door caught we're like wait a minute how could we attach the chain lock when we were leaving what that doesn't make any sense what just happened and then we looked through and we we saw everything was just destroyed on the inside Oh, good. And so then once you, and it was uh, while I was on uh, Christmas vacation from school. And so, you know, once again, it was like, right, this is bad enough. And so just, you know, drank in our hotel we stayed at for the next, you know, couple of days while getting used to things. And um, so that just became kind of the pattern. And it was like, if anybody looked at me from the outside compared to most normal people, you would say that those are occasions that, like, I'm not really going to hold it against you that you had a little bit too much to drink while safely at home. Um, no, I mean, no, nobody would think anything of it, right. um, but as in light of my family's history and in light of probably me having a lot of my father in me and in light of kind of even psychologically a little bit of what I was teaching myself and how to cope with things, there's some real bad ideas. And so graduated from Bible college, got a position at a church and um, of about six months in, right whenever things started to, right when I got hired full time, I was hired first twenty hours per week, and then six months in, they hired me full time. Um, there was all sorts of drama at the church, and there was a leadership change, and the how what stuff that went on, and so it was real stressful. And at the same time, I was having a bunch of success, but there was just like a lot of stress I wasn't normally used to, and so then it kind of turned into Sunday night, and it, but like the the student ministry was just going great at the same time. And like the local paper ran a front page article on some of the programming I was doing. 
And so it's like just this time with a bunch of these really big highs and lows. And so part of my decompressing on Sunday nights was I, I can have something to drink. And once again, nothing that if anyone saw it from the outside for a normal person where they would think anything of it. But in light of my family history and what I was actually doing, quite dangerous. And that it kind of slowly escalated over the span of a couple of years. And I remember one point in time in there, my, my wife was in our bedroom and I had, I'd had a little bit to drink that night. And I went to the refrigerator and I was like, I want to drink a little bit more, but I know that my wife probably wouldn't like that. Mm. And I was like, so I better all, and I even like opened the refrigerator door just the right way to kind of block the view so she couldn't see what I was doing and drank something. And then I had that thought in my head of like, wait, this is what alcoholics do. Like I grew up with this in my house. Mm-hmm. This is a bad path. And I had that thought, but I didn't change anything. Because once again, I, I can compare myself to all kinds of other people. And this is, I'm not doing anything terribly bad. I'm at home safely, just decompressing, rationalizing a bunch of different things. And then starting in December 2012, there was about a year straight of just constant, constant tragedy. It started with a girl at the local high school committing suicide, 16 years old, um, and shot herself in the head. Hmm. And um, I was a counselor at the high school the next day heavily involved with, you know, just sitting down, processing with all these students. And it really rocked the community. But that, and that led into 2013, where there was just kind of tragedy after tragedy. And I mean, it was, you know, 50 year old man dying in a car accident. That year, both of my remaining grandparents died. And of the people that died, it was kind of the ones that emotionally hit me the least, even though they were the people I was closest to mm. because they were in their 90s. And I was like, well, this isn't a tragedy. They had a great full life. And everything else was just. Uh, there was three different suicides that ended up happening, and um, and I'd been teetering on that edge of very unwise behavior before this, and I'd had this thought right before this, isn't this what alcoholics do? And then it just kind of turned into a period of time that spanned about a year where there was an there was a really good excuse, like, hey, if there's a reason to do something unwise, it, this well, this is also a good reason. Well, this is also a good reason, and it just kind of pushed me into into the full spiral of all the things that go along with alcoholism of uh, the secrecy lies deception covering things up just everything that um normal people don't um they don't really understand and then you show up to like an aa meeting or recovery meeting and everyone starts telling the exact same stories even if they have wildly different backgrounds contexts and everything and it's like oh we all did the exact same bizarre strange things huh um, but it just led to this really kind of dark period of time from 2013. And in there, I had uh, windows where I said, like, now I get my wife figured out I was had a big problem. She's like, you have to stop. And I'm like, okay, man, I'll stop. And so just through sheer willpower, I'd stop for two months and then just relapse. And it, just, it kept doing this back and forth all in secret. Um, and even in the windows of time where I would have like, I think there's one where I had like six months where I didn't drink in this this really awful time period. They have the, what's called like a dry drunk, where mm-hmm. you're you're still just as screwed up, you're still just as broken, and you're just waiting for that next time that you're going to get the drink, and it, it's just it's it's really strange because there's it's it, it heartbreaking a little bit because that that three years right there is when my my first daughter was born in 2014, and then my son was born in 2012. So the early years for both of them, I don't remember very well, and don't really want to remember very well. Um, because there were just such an awful time period and it's, um, I was just so unhealthy for such a long period of time, but, um, yeah, so then it, it all kind of came crashing down, um, uh, summer 2016 in the middle of basically the biggest youth event that we did of the year, a thing called boot camp, And just like right in the middle of it, I'd, I'd had been doing really great and had this massive relapse like a week before boot camp. And every time, you know, we, people don't understand is when you have the relapse, every time it escalates, every time it gets crazier and more and more dangerous and just your body's recovered just a little bit, but you go back to the behavior you were doing before. And so it seriously screws up your body and does cr- messes you up. I didn't know any of this. Um, I was, um, yeah. So found myself in a real bad spot and I, I'd been able to cover for my odd behaviors almost this whole time, just very functional as an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And then 
at this this retreat deal, it um I'd gotten weird enough. Like stuff was off enough that a guy started confronting me, like, um, I've seen you weird a long time. Like, have you were you drinking when this happened? Oh no, no of course not. No, no, no. I'm I'm just tired. I haven't been asleep. And he kept coming back every like two hours, like, seriously. Something was uh, so this is not the same. Like I have seen you a long period of time, and this is getting this is very different. Oh no, no, no. And so eventually he told me to go home. He's like, you need to go home, get a good night's sleep, whatever's going on, wow. go sort through it. Hmm. So I go home and my wife's like, what are you doing home? And I was like, well, they sent me home because I was, they just didn't think I was healthy and I was acting weird. And, um, you know, this guy thought I'd been drinking. She's like, to her knowledge, I haven't been drink six months or something like that. So mm-hmm. she's like, yeah, have you been drinking? Uh, well, yes, I had been. Yeah, that's he. He actually had caught me in something. And she's like, well, um, I'm. And she's like, I'm done with this. Like, where I'm gonna, I'm going to let them know what's happening. She's like, and I'm like, no, no, don't do that. Um, let's set a date a week from now. So like, we're in the middle of the worst week of the year to do this. Like, let's not do that. Um, and she's like, no, we have to. I was like, no, no, let's let's hold off a little bit and just we need to get through this week where it's we're not dropping a bomb on everybody. Else. And then I went to go to sleep that night and. I started thinking like, wait, what is going on that everything is getting so bad so fast? So I just started doing research on alcohol and I started realizing like I'm having all these serious symptoms of withdrawal, mm. which that's when, you know, you're like in a bad, like you're way far down this path and started reading it. And there's oh, another thing people don't realize, like uh, alcohol is way up there on the list of most dangerous things to withdraw, have withdrawal from. Um, people think it's oh, it's just alcohol. It's not a big deal. Like no, alcohol withdrawal is extremely dangerous. Um, and so I started reading all this stuff and educating myself at four in the morning because I just couldn't sleep because my body was so screwed up. And I went, oh, okay, this we're done with this. Like the okay, back to the wife's plan. It it ends now. It just kind of had that realization. Like I, I am in the middle of the most important week of the year for this this church thing. Uh, that's the thing I care so much about. Um, and I'm a total train wreck cause I'm so out of control. This has to end. And I, like, I can't keep living this lie. I'm not, I'm not doing any of this anymore. So literally at five in the morning, uh, called my mom, told her what was up. Hey, can you come over and watch my kids? Um, uh, and I wanted to do something dramatic. So we even went into an ER, um, uh, just to like double check, make sure everything was good. And, and especially cause it's like, that's it's not a bad idea if you're in withdrawal from alcohol, just to do that, to, to not die. Um, so went in 7 a.m., called that guy that had been confronting me, like, hey man, remember all those times I said no, I hadn't been drinking? The correct answer to your question was yes, I had been drinking, or at least I was messed up from drinking the night before. I was yes, you it's and I'm writing a very long letter to to you and the elder boards, giving you the full history, the version of the story that I just told all of you on the podcast here. Mailed that to them from I think the hospital, or emailed them from the hospital. And, um, you know, within, within you know, that next Sunday, they announced my resignation mm. at the church. And um, one month after that, I started my YouTube channel. So <laughs> um, that's looping back to how I got to YouTube. But, um, yeah, I um, resigned with no plan. It was just I got to that point in time where, like, I can't continue this. And I'm, I got to the point where, like, I'm... I have to be more concerned about my family, my health, my actual spiritual growth, the ministry. I actually care about all those things a lot more than I cared about my reputation. And that's and you, and you put it that way, it's like that sounds really stupid that you put all those things on the line for your reputation, but that's what people do every single day. One hundred percent. One hundred. And uh, and and, and um, you know, and that that was what led to years of you know, if in 2013 I had been like, man, um. Uh, I just drank a month straight because I was um, in the middle of, I don't know, depression is probably not the right word, but in the middle of emotional empty from tragedy. If in the middle of that, I had gone to the elder board at that point in time and said, guys, I need help. Like this whole thing just crushed me. It wrecked me. And this is how I coped with it. The The response to it at that point in time would be have been much easier for everyone than it would have been, hey, guys, for the last three years, I've been a secret alcoholic. Um but it was all, I don't want to lose my job. I'm nervous about what people think about me. I want people to think I'm the pastor guy. And, you know, I was more concerned about being perceived as pastor guy, good guy than being. a. And, you know, that's all, all of that just feeds into the lies, the deception of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And so then um, the church 
um, we're still at the church. There's about six months where we left for a little bit to it just needed some distance to get healthy on all sides for them, for me, everything. Uh, Cause it was, it was, it's obviously weird when you go from being the second most prominent person at a church to being um, the, the former alcoholic pastor guy. So uh, mm-hmm. there's a little bit where we left there about after uh, the one year mark, we left for six months, but we, we asked them, do you want us to, we want to do whatever I'm going to do, whatever you tell me to do. And if you want me to leave, we'll, we'll leave. If you want us to stay, we will stay. And if we stay, whatever you write the action plan here, you write the um, redemption, reconciliation, restoration um, story here. And so that's basically what happened. I just went to the elders and they said, yeah, we want you to stay. We think that that's what's healthiest for everyone is if um, we see that someone can struggle with sin and not be ostracized. Um, obviously there's consequences for this. You can't, you need to, you can't work here while you're working through all this, but um, at the same time, um, we, we, of course we love, we want you to be here. And we want to help you get through this. And so then they actually, you know, um, you know, funded all of the recovery stuff that I, I went to in a program. And like w- at the point in time where I started my YouTube channel, I was in the middle of an intensive outpatient uh, addiction program. Um, and um, so, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's real weird to think about how the way all this stuff played out and it's all directly tied together. Um, and it was like cool. a, a human's life. It's all tied together. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty weird because um, at the one year anniversary or the two year and the three year anniversary of my sobriety, I posted my story, my, that, this has been the 15 minute version, but I posted the 30 minute version of this. And um, it's weird to think about that, but each one of those videos has over 30,000 views. And I mean, in eight years of being a pastor, um, obviously I had much deeper connections to people, but nowhere near that number of people uh, heard my story, my struggles, my gospel, or the gospel through all of that. And just through my struggles in the platform that I've gained afterwards, whenever I share my story and the importance of surrender, humility, and not solving it on your own, it's heard by a lot more people because of the the whole journey I've been through. Mm. Don't really, really recommend this path. Uh, that's not the best yeah. way to get here. But um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, here we are on the other side of it and um, doing my best to try and um, leverage it for the, the good of others and God and God's glory. Something that that I think that we need to we need to do, Sean, is eventually we can't do it today. But um, I come from a family that has been really torn apart by alcoholism. Um, so I think it would be really cool to put both of our perspectives together yeah um to kind of help tell your story and or i guess help tell my story um because there's there's a really unique perspective i think you could share and i think we could reach a lot of people that way that's crazy man one of the things that's interesting about everything you're saying sean uh, well i guess there's a few interesting things for one uh, ben and I are, are open about the fact that um, we are Christians and we don't anticipate that everybody listening to this is a Christian. And that's the, the purpose of this podcast is not to, um, you know, have a church service, but it's one of the things that we want to make sure people understand is that the fact that you are a human being should automatically allow you the I don't know, the space to admit when things are wrong or when things don't go the way you planned or you have uh, a failure or a a hard lesson learned or something like that. Because ultimately, there is not a single person alive on the planet right now that has not had some tragedy, obstacle, failure, what something negative. The difference is we're, we're trying to make sure people understand, at least from our podcast, it is okay to talk about those things and it's okay to talk about it. Um, I have to be careful with my language here in my choice of words, because I don't want to communicate the wrong thing, but it's, it's okay to have a casual conversation, not a lighthearted conversation, not necessarily a light and like take it as if it's a flippant thing, but a casual conversation. It doesn't have to be emotionally draining every time we talk about a serious topic, but sometimes it is. And sometimes that that's necessary uh, because of the nature of the topic, but we do appreciate you sharing uh, your story. I, 
I would love to know, um, just to kind of steer us back on, on course a little bit as you've now gotten out of that, uh, that obstacle in that period in your life, I, I would argue, and I bet you, you would probably say the same, that it's something that will always be present, but like, it's always a, a choice, a struggle and obstacles, that sort of thing. It's just a matter of if you're, you're winning or losing at the time. Um, I don't know how you would word that per se, but um, as you continue to grow in the YouTube sphere and you do have that platform that continues to grow, um, how do you see, you know, your story, your background, your experiences, how do you see that impacting and affecting other people's lives because the whole point of what we're talking about here on this episode and we're having kind of an interesting twist here that i wasn't planning on we were planning on talking about how movies and tv shows can affect us both at a individual a micro level and then us as a society a macro level so how do you think your youtube videos about your story could or have already affected other people well, I mean, I mean, I can just say, uh, giving specifics, every time I post my story, I get a bunch of people that direct message me immediately afterwards, either saying they, I inspired them to quit uh, drinking, that they're struggling right now, that they've been there before. I mean, every time I share it, I get that. Wow. And I still, I still kind of get those um, because, you know, the way YouTube works, that they resurface stuff and um, and so even within right. the last couple of days, I've had, um, someone say, man, your story really inspired me. I, you know, I love talking about movies and then it just kind of popped up with the, the your sobriety video and is really powerful. Uh, I get that very regularly and it almost seems like it's getting a little bit more regular. Maybe it's just, just because, um, we're about to the one year mark when I'll post another one for the four years sobriety in about three weeks from now. Oh, wow. And so then there's a bunch of people that are new to my channel over the last several months that are just now kind of discovering it could just be that, but um, you know, I, I know someone that uh, or one person that messages with me that um, I think they watched my first sobriety video came out about two years ago, just shy two years ago, uh, struggled to start being sober right at first. And now they're, they're almost a year at sobriety. That's awesome. And they, I mean, they, they told me, Hey, this is it. No, this is, this is, I really made a change this time. And we're at one month, we're at six months. Um, and they, they said that they just hit 11 months, um, within the last few days. And that's, that's really cool. That's the, that kind and, of stuff keeps you going. Like, yeah. I and wish that, that more people understood that. Like, I, I, I hope that that experience, not, not necessarily just like you sharing your story, you shared it, but I'm, I'm saying the, the domino effect that happened because you shared your story. You know, I, I hope that. If it's through our podcast, if it's through your podcast, your YouTube channel, whatever it may be, I frankly don't care. I just wish that people understood more that sharing what's going on in your world, even sometimes the negatives, that it can actually bless and benefit other people. Um, just a, a few episodes, I think two episodes ago, we had Elizabeth on our show and she and I talked about our two miscarriages and she quoted uh, Brene Brown. Ben, fix it if I mess up the quote, but it's basically your story could be someone else's survival or may be someone else's survival guide. Yeah. And I think that's what I, that's the whole purpose of our podcast. Uh, I know you and I talked about brand. What's your main core objective? And our objective is to get people talking, get people to have those conversations that otherwise they wouldn't have to find out that you don't have a monopoly on struggle in life. You don't have a monopoly on pain or difficulty. But if you find out because you're talking about it, that other people have those experiences, we, shockingly, we actually might start to heal collectively a lot faster uh, and be better off for it. So I really appreciate you stepping out on and using your platform to uh, hopefully affect some change. Mm -hmm. I do want to. I do want to jump into um, just a couple questions. I know we've been uh, <clears throat> listening to your story, and I think that honestly, we could end the pod episode right now, and and that would be <laughs> perfect. Um, but uh, for the sake of conversation, we've 
we're doing kind of this mini series on technology and the different aspects of it. Uh, last week we did video games and just the gamer society, uh, if you will. And, and just get Ben and I are gamers. You're a gamer. So, um, you definitely can resonate with that. This week we're talking about TV shows and movies. And what I did not anticipate was YouTube videos, which now, uh, ties right into what we're discussing. But I would, I would love to know, uh, from your background, you know, what have you seen in, in the terms of like video entertainment and TV entertainment, just motion picture, what do you see it, uh, the starting point? What was the starting point of entertainment? Just in your own words, where did it start? Where do you think it's kind of evolved into now? Is it the um, same? Is it different? How is it different? That sort of thing. The starting point of, in regards to me? Just film. No, 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 no. Just film. Just or, like, why do people film things? What did it start as? And then what has it turned into? Um, I mean, it's just people have always resonated with stories. And so then storytelling, okay. Storytelling, it, it, it's, it's, uh, whether that's was the spoken word, epic poems, then novels, and then technology created a scenario where you could tell a story with moving pictures. Mm. And that's immediately where the, the medium gravitated toward was stored to- storytelling. People have always enjoyed that. And so you gave them this, this is one where you can escape to these stories that you're, you're then seeing in front of you. And, you know, then as technologies advanced, those stories have gotten more complex, more believable, and uh, able to tell bigger and grander stories that, uh, you know, these days you can tell essentially any story and capture yeah. it in pretty CGI. amazing detail. It was CGI <laughs> and take, take you off to these other worlds. And um, that's what what people resonate with it. As far back as we can tell, people have been telling stories and um, using their creativity to imagine possibilities and things that excite them. And that's what movies do. And one of the things that I think makes movies particularly unique amongst the different ways that we tell stories is that it's it's self-contained. You can tell a yeah. full arc. Um, right there in one movie. And it's not just a short story. It's not like a little anecdote. It's not just a scene. It's a full story that you consume in one sitting. Whereas a TV show, they keep going their seasons. You know, some obviously yeah. episodic television, sometimes it's 40, 20 minutes, sometimes it's 40 minutes. But the, then you have next week's episode. Um, or with a novel, it's a contained story, but most novels take you eight, 20. If it's a Sting, Stephen King novel, 100 hours to read. Um, you you know, there, say that as I have the last Dark Tower book on my nightstand that I'm close yeah. to finishing. He's staring at you. <laughs> yep. You started it when you were in high school and you're almost done. <laughs> um, um, but like they they take time. And that's where even sometimes when people are like, the book's always better. Like, oh, you know, I know exactly what you're saying. I totally resonate with what you're saying. There is something magic to being able to watch the Dark Tower movie in 90 minutes. Actually, there's nothing magical about that movie. It's yeah, pretty that bad. was a terrible one. Um, yeah. <laughs> pretty terrible. But, you know... They, and, and side we, note, I found out that the the Amazon potential Amazon series has also been nixed. So yeah. I was all excited. And now they're, they're pitching it to other networks, but uh, I don't know. No, I, keep I trying it. it keeps getting shot down. But yeah. um, there, there's something about being able to tell these fantastical stories in this for uh fashion but you know there's always these modern day retellings of classic mythology whether it was 40 years back with star wars 20 years back with harry potter or the current um marvel cinematic universe they all kind of touch on the same stories and redemptive arcs told in new ways for new new contextualized in new ways for new generations but uh, you know joseph campbell wrote his book a hero with a thousand faces 50 years ago and that's what cinema has been ever since then but Joseph Campbell was looking at mythology from all these different cultures going back thousands of years. There's yep. all people telling stories with these same sorts of experiences. And as much as society has changed, and it absolutely has, as crazy and diverse as we are, we're also all just humans and we touch on the same exact emotions. So, so what do you go ahead? Sorry. We're all kind of the same at the end of the day. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, do you think that it, touching the way I view it is like the the core content is like the skeleton and then over time the the flesh has changed. So like, you know, the the story of the underdog kind of thing comes to mind, like the kid who nobody thought was going to make it and then he works at it and then proves them wrong in the end, but he helps other people along the way. Like that's like a core story but it's been shown in many different <laughs> variants mm-hmm. over the years. Um, do you think that when movies and shows tap into those core timeless uh, bones, does that, is that what makes a movie more or less successful? Um, Cause I, I feel like to kind of answer my own question, then I'll let you answer. I feel like the answer is yes and no. Like it could, but as we saw with, perfect example the dark tower movie idris elba matthew mcconaughey two fantastic actors and yet that movie was a flop why right something was askew there what do you think was the difference maker in making that one a flop more than a success well i i mean it's it's you know there's a lot of different ways to define success and so um you know obviously there's does it just is it a quality film which that's there's a lot of subjectivity into that. Sure. And how much does it really resonate on deep levels with a broad group of people? Yeah. And so then when you look at the sorts of movies that have wild, broad, mainstream success, um, you know, they're they're almost all these big exciting spectacle films that do things that just have just think they're exciting. Whether it's as stupid as Fast and the Furious and Vin Diesel is driving a car from one building to the <laughs> other building. No matter where you're at, there's just something amusing about something that ridiculous. Um, and, but then you you look at these top movies of all time, whether it's Endgame, Avatar, um, you know, Titanic. They you know they all have really big emotions inside of them. They're all yeah. touching on some very uh, you know the top three of all time: Titanic, Endgame, Avatar. Three wildly different movies, um, but at the same time, you know. Uh, all three of them have severe tragedy inside of them. Obviously, Titanic, that you know what that one is. Avatar. Whoa, I mean, spoiler they, alert. Yeah, I, I didn't say what it was. I didn't say what happens. I'm just saying there's tragedy in all these. You know, Avatar, there's like it gets really depressing 66 of the way percent of the way through it. You look at Endgame and you know the starting premise of the movie is that half the universe is dead. In the first hour is everyone going through grief counseling. And so like it touches on really deep stuff while being very exciting and fun in these other ways with what they do. And they, so they touch on a, a broad array of emotions while having big spectacle to them. So I think, and you know, Avatar was for 10 years, the most successful film of all time by a lot. And it was essentially the same plot as all these other movies, which on the one hand is kind of a joke that it's Pocahontas dances with wolves, the last samurai fern goalie repackaged with big, tall blue aliens. But at the same time, the the reason that that kind of works is because it's a story template that it's built inside of it is this full spectrum of an underdog story. It's it has um, redemptive redemption inside of it. You have a lead character that has a very strong arc where they're transformed by a, by a noble people. I mean, it just it, it does all these things that people have been excited by and been telling stories about for a long time, all in this one package. And it was in three D, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual flowers would come towards your face in the theater. So, I mean, I think that's some of it of like, why are the, some of these movies so successful? Well, because they, they touch on this stuff that connects with the most people and, you know, Oh, why some people get mad when this really well-made movie, but it's about something really niche. Right. And they're like, it's, they get mad that that one wasn't successful. And you're like, ah, like Blade Runner 2049, great movie, great design, great acting. Very niche audience. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a sci-fi <laughs> film that's not really all that exciting. It, they market it a little bit as big sci-fi, like it had action, but it doesn't have that much action in it. You know, it's like this existential film about what does it mean to be alive? You know, that mm-hmm. it's for the right audience. They absolutely loved it, but most people, like, they're, they're not sitting there, like, debating are androids alive? Like, what if they have emotions? When does life begin <laughs> with android? Like, right. like that, that's pretty niche, even though it's an interesting concept explored very well. 
and that's where I, I think, you know, where does success come from with some of these movies? It's it if you want to have a wildly successful movie, make a movie that's very big and exciting that touches on a lot of the human experience. And you do that, and then suddenly you get a lot of people to show up because it resonates on a deeper level with more people. Yeah. Some people recognize that and some people don't, you know, like I feel like plenty of people could tell you that they enjoyed Endgame, and I can say that collectively because of the amount of money it made. Uh, a lot of people could say they enjoyed Endgame, but if you ask them, why did you enjoy it? Or what about the movie did you enjoy? I don't think the mass majority would be able to define it as like, oh, it's a shared common human experience. I'm right. sorry. We don't all have uh, Barney's older gangster brother, Thanos, running around uh, with a double blade sword or something. That's not a common human experience. Being yeah. able to explain then the deeper mechanics of what is going on and then even the the mythology of the superheroes, which I was a religious studies minor and we talked a lot in different classes about mythology and what does that say more about us as human beings than it does about you know just the stories that we're telling. Um, so I, I think that you touched on a lot of solid points there about just the successes. And I think it's all storytelling and how do we communicate that in the best way possible? So speaking of storytelling, how do you think the, those movies or TV can affect us as individuals or affect us as a society? And I would love to throw out the example of the office because, um, I, I think that it has affected my life in a very deep and powerful way. Uh, but I know that even what, geez, when did that show end? Like the office 2012, 12. Okay. So 2012, it ends in 2012 and yet eight years later and we're still, it's like still <laughs> pop still, culture. Still watching it. <laughs> yeah. Ben just started watching it like yesterday. So, I mean, oh people are gosh. still picking it up. On my fourth <laughs> You're watch never going to live this down. <laughs> You're never going to live this down. Ever. Ben, please tell Sean live on the air uh, when you started watching The Office. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to <laughs> talk about it. I, I think somebody somebody at some point, like, I don't know what it is about. It, maybe it's just how I'm wired as a human being. But when everybody's like, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. You should check this out. Everybody's doing it. I'm like, you know what? Just because everybody's doing it now, I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it was kind I've of got the, a lot of that contrary to in me it was some of the same effect for me it was everybody was like oh the office is so good and like i said before like i've never really been one for tv shows like movies different different story i've always loved movies and just like you said like in two hours time you can you can absorb an entire story so for those you know for those two hours i can completely veg out zone out and enjoy a story and then it's over and i have no more commitment where i find that like with shows like i like watch one episode and i'm i'm like okay this is this is okay i get to episode two okay this is this is fun and then here it is 3 30 a.m and i'm like shoot i should go to bed but this show's so yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> you know that's the american way so Netflix, it's just like are you still I, watching Boy, I didn't put down the remote. Come on now. Like for the longest time. That's why like I like avoided TV shows. And then finally, I don't know, Mike. I honestly don't know the answer to this question. Like, was it four years ago? Three years ago? Three years ago, four years ago, somebody at some point was like, you should do this. And I heard it for the thousandth time. And I was like, all right, I'll bite. And I that told you 300 of those thousand times. I don't, that's the end of that story. It. Like I will, I, that, <laughs> that show will always be on in the background. Like if the TV's on in the background, that's what's playing. Like if nobody's watching it, like, I don't know about you guys. Michael like, Scarn, yeah, we'll, we'll be like making dinner or something. Hey, throw something on the office. office. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So Sean, how do you think movies or TV have affected us? Um, well, I mean, as a mechanism of storytelling, they're they're a way to explore humanity and they're a way to communicate ideas. Um, and so I think there's there's always ways in which trends in Hollywood will trickle down into society. Mm. And um and that, that should scare us, that should be Good, bad, it should be all that stuff. My it's first not thought was anymore. not always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, not, definitely not a good thing. But, I mean, you, you just, you know, 
Hollywood has their own set of morality and you can see that in what they celebrate in movies. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's not always a good thing when, you know, one of their favorite comedy genres is uh, high schoolers and college students trying to get to a party to do drugs in each other. You go, okay, is it how responsible of a a, a (laughs) genre is this? Um, You literally have a whole sub genre that's about underage kids doing drugs and as it turns out, um, this has consequences in real life. So, I mean, I think there's stuff like that. Shocking. That, that, you know, there's a lot of times where they, they normalize things where you're like, probably shouldn't normalize this. And then at the same time, I think it's uncomfortable when they want to lecture us at the same time as normalizing the dangerous behaviors they want to lecture us about. Mm. What are you guys doing? Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I think other times you, using The Office as an example, um, I mean, what it one of the reasons it resonates with people is that in the good seasons, the humor was based around in the the good seasons. I'm sorry. That qualifier is perfect in the good seasons. (laughs) It's in, this is not true in the bad seasons. um, that the humor was largely based around what are actual office stereotypes. And those office stereotypes are funny, whether you've been in an office or not. And they have truth, even to people that you know, in real life that just kind of behave in a certain fashion. And so then each of these characters kind of represents someone that you might actually know in real life. Yeah. That's why I think the, the the bad seasons, they lost that. Everyone turned into a cartoon character and everyone was like, like trying to out, outdo each other. And so it just, that's why they're not the good seasons to me because that's not what was interesting about the show. Like, hey, look, we did something crazy and ridiculous and even more over the top. And Dwight's walking around with a gun firing in the office. Like, okay, I think we lost sight of what, <laughs> what made the show interesting. At a certain point in time, it but yep. like in the, those early seasons, um, I like I knew all kinds of people. Like, oh man, I tried to watch The Office, but Michael Scott is just too much like my actual boss. And obviously, yeah, the caricature. But at the same time, we all have that boss. Or, you know, most everyone's had the boss at some point in time, or that coworker that at some point, in some way, um, was trying way too hard to be cool while being clueless. And so they're on the one hand trying to be your best friend. And on the other hand, doing things that are driving you absolutely crazy. Um, and I think stuff like that is what <laughs> just absolutely resonates with people um, in what, when, what it was doing. And so it becomes a mirror to society if you could be like, you could literally just like play episodes of the show for people and scenes from the show and be like in your office and be like, don't be this person. Don't do like it's little plot lines. And they're not plots of the episode, but they're subplots that it's about people fighting over the, the air conditioner. That's every office in America is people oh, fighting with the totally. air conditioner. Um, and then, you know, you have one guy, I like it a little bit cooler. And other person's like, I like it warmer. And that's all normal stuff. And so it's a mirror that makes us go, oh, we're being ridiculous. What we're doing. So, yeah, I, I think that all of that's accurate. Um, and it, it's like you said, it's not that they're doing some. Oh, oh, actually, when they did the over the top jokes, they didn't land. Because people actually resonated with yeah. the the normal. What? The, oh, oh, I I can tell you from my comment section in my office videos. There's a group of people that love some of that stuff, and they get so <laughs> mad at me. Like, what are you talking about? That was one of the best episodes. It's like, hey, if you just want to watch the show for big, gigantic, uh, broad comedy, that's all just yep. like, look how wacky and crazy. Cool. I'm not judging you. I'm I openly told you in the video what I like about the show is when it's grounded. And not the big broad stuff. Or almost all the cast is grounded and then Dwight is the one crazy character. That's what works worked about him early on is he's the one guy that seems detached from reality. And when you get to season seven and everyone is detached from reality, it it, it lost what made the show interesting. So lost there were people that, 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 that did like the just wild bonkers antics. Yep. So I... I, one of the things that uh, that concerns me, and um, we're we're kind of out of time for today, but uh, one of the things that concerns me is having been a teacher, and I know you having been a youth pastor, seeing the ways that uh, movies and TV shows, like you said, normalize things that probably shouldn't be normalized, but then to, I was about to say immature, like an undeveloped mind or somebody who hasn't had the life experiences that an adult has, um, they tend to see those things on movies or TV shows and then they want to go recreate them as if that's what's supposed to happen in their lives. Not realizing that 
oh, that's that's actually an outlier. But because your favorite actor, actress, whatever is on that show or in that movie, then all of a sudden you're like, I've got to be, you know, Zach Efron, the next door neighbor kind of right. thing, just throwing parties every every day. Um, so I mean, they, they, they fully present that as wait, when you were in college, you didn't get drunk all the time, do drugs. Yeah, what's wrong with you? It's like you didn't do that. Like that's like the plot of the movie is if you're not engaged in that behavior, you're a loser. That's the whole subgenre. Like that's yep. at the core of what the, the belief system in them. Um, and that's what they present as what college. Is. And there's so many problems. with that. Yeah. Like yeah. so many problems. Even if you kind of remove Christian morality outside of it, and all of you're doing is based off of their own worldview, the idea that you would look down on people for not behaving like that doesn't even fit into a tolerance worldview of yeah. morality either. Like it doesn't, um, it, and you know, they don't even the the lack of self awareness of the power of narratives is, is pretty astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing that I, I've learned even being a parent and having been a teacher is that uh, you have to be self-aware of what other people are seeing. And it's not that you're necessarily living for other people. I guess being a parent, you kind of are. You, I live for my kids. I love them. But as a let's say as a teacher, I'm not necessarily living my life in a way that, at least at first, not in a way that that my students could look at me and be like, I want to be exactly like coach Brown whenever I grow up kind of thing. But you do need to need to have that self-awareness of other people are watching me. So if they were to follow me or do what I'm doing, what are they going to end up doing? What are they going to be a part of that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Um, Even down to, I'd see trash in the hallway and I would knee jerk reaction would be to tell another kid to pick it up. But I started thinking like, if they never see me pick up a piece of trash, why would they pick up trash? So you right. then zoom out to the broad scope of what's being put out on worldwide uh, theater screens and what's being put out on worldwide TV screens via Netflix or whatever. That's when I start to kind of wonder how, how entertainment through movies and TVs, how, how has that become kind of the rudder to a societal ship. Yeah. That's kind of been my overarching thought. So to kind of wrap this up, um, thinking about like, how do we keep ourselves balanced? Like you just said, even from a, a tolerance worldview, there are still certain things that we really shouldn't be messing around with. Um, I, I do think that this is probably speaking more to teenagers, but even some adults, like as you watch movies and you watch TV shows, we get input from a variety of sources these days. Some are good and some aren't. So it can affect it, every aspect of our lives, our mentality, which then affects our perspective and our behavior. So um, we need to really be mindful of our input and acknowledge the, the inputs that are coming in um, just to make sure that in the end, we have that solid footing with which to interact in the world. So um, Sean, is there anything else you would like to share with us before we close this thing out? Uh, what you do, where we can find you. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube. Just look up Sean Chandler. You'll either find an NFL player or a guy that is talking about movies. It's the guy that's talking about <laughs> movies. Um, I'm on Instagram at Sean Talks About and also pretty active on Twitter with the handle Kirk Never Died. Um, I didn't do that wise thing where people have the same name on all social media. I went for totally different names on everything. So <laughs> it was a wise choice on my part, but I'm very active on all kind of social media, pretty easy to find uh, on all the places talking about movies too much. <clears throat> cool. Awesome. We'll, we'll, def- we'll definitely give everybody the, the links to all of your uh, social profiles so that whatever they prefer, they can go then hunt you down. Make sure to add to that running tally of, you know, subscribers. We're going to have to get you back on here. You're chocked full of good information. (laughs) Oh, this was just scratching the surface of my nuggets of wisdom. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I think, um, I think this is the start of a good, of a good relationship. I like it. (laughs) We'll have to call you, uh, Sean Chandler, our life correspondent. (laughs) I like it. All right, Sean, thank you so much for your time. Take care. You're having me. Thanks, Sean. Bye-bye. 
Hey guys, thanks so much for listening and supporting us. If you'd like to continue to support us in the MVP podcast, you can actually head over to audible.com. The link should be in the description and sign up for the free 30 day trial. It's our gift to you. It's awesome. It's risk free. And guess what? You get to get all of that reading done that you've been wanting to do without any reading. All you have to do is listen to it. It's great. Also, if you like the podcast or you appreciate Micah and myself, please share with friends and family as this is for them too. We want to reach as many people as we can. And lastly, if you want to connect with us, you can actually reach us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at ActualMBP, or you can email us at ActualMBP at gmail.com. That is all. Y'all have a good one. Thanks.